Hello, this is Jim McKeith in Developer Relations from Barcadero Technologies, and welcome to Beyond the App. So our agenda, first thing we're going to talk about is what exactly is an app and what do we mean by Beyond the App. Then we're going to talk about some examples of going beyond the app with notifications, share sheets, debug logging, and inter-app communications. So what is an app? An app is a single window of information and interaction. It could contain multiple displays or screens, but it runs inside a sandbox and all the interactions contained within that sandbox. So if you think about the platform having all these apps on it, and we launch an app, and we interact with that app, and then that app goes away, and all the interaction remained inside that app. Delphi XE5 is great for making apps, but how, what do we want to do if we want to go beyond being inside of that app boundary? So some examples of going beyond, which is what we're going to talk about, is uh, notifications on iOS and Android, badges on iOS, messaging between apps. Um, we can access camera rolls or contacts, other shared storage, for example, writing to the SD card, uh, debug logging, and then inter-app communication where you're actually sending messages from one app to another on the same device. So notification services is the first example of going beyond the app. And what this gives you the ability to do is to send a notification to the platform that will be displayed to the user outside of the app boundaries in the notification center. This is achieved by using the Team Notification Center component. And all you have to do is create a notification, set some properties on it, and then either present the notification or schedule the notification. You can follow that URL there for some good information on how to do notifications. Share sheet is an example of how we can take information from within our app and pass out of our app to other apps via the sharing mechanism built into the platform. So this, this is great for when you want to post to Facebook or Twitter, and you don't want to have to mess with the authentication or APIs yourself. You can just use the share sheet as a simple mechanism to do that. You can send pictures and or text, and you can achieve this through a standard action. On iOS, the share sheet calls the OS, and then the uh, social media accounts that are defined in the OS are able to handle that share sheet call. That could be email, Facebook, Twitter. On Android, any app can register to handle these requests, and so you'll get quite a bit of options there from Android. So if you want to use a share sheet, you, ha you add a T action list and then add a standard action of T show share sheet action. You can then assign that action, or you can manually invoke it by calling execute action in the name of your share sheet action, which in this case would be show share sheet action one. And you have to call that on a control. So if you had a button one, you'd say button one dot execute action, show share sheet action one. And then it's important that you handle the on before execute event of the action, and that's where you assign the, or the text message and the bitmap for the action, the share sheet. So let's talk about debug logging. Debug logging is a way that you can send messages from your app to the console to track the internal state of your app. Um, you can actually leave this in for shipping apps, but you want to be careful about that because uh, you could be divulging important information that you don't want public because anybody could read this these messages, or you may be bogging down just by logging way too much information. It just kind of bogs the system down if you're doing that. But it can be useful because you can have somebody grab this log file and send it to you later. There's different calls and different console locations for each platform. We're gonna go through and talk about each one individually, but I'm also gonna tell you about uh, DX library. It's got a uh, unit in there called DX utils logger, which I'll talk a little bit about as well. This provides an abstraction library across all of these, all four platforms we're gonna talk about. So highly recommend to check that out, but I'm gonna tell you how the logging works on each platform individually. On Windows, you can call output debug string, and that method is in the Windows unit. So if you use the Windows unit, you can call output debug string. That's what the uh, call would look like there. And then that shows up in the event log window in Delphi when you're debugging your application. If you're not debugging your application, there's a few other utilities. Here's three of them listing here. Um, one is in GXperts, one is in CBN Experts, CNPAC, and then the other one is debug view from Microsoft. And all these utilities grab everything that's written to the um, output debug, through output debug string. 
And then most of these utilities offer the ability to filter that information so you can just get your logs because any app on the system that's writing to output debug string will show up in those uh, third-party log viewers. It's actually kind of interesting to run these and see what kind of information is popping up because, like I said, that can be left in shipping applications. It's worth noting there are a few alternatives to output debug string on Windows, uh, two of which are CodeSight by Ray Software and SmartInspect by Gorok Software. Now, CodeSight's actually included with Delphi XC5, or a, a version of CodeSight is, or you can get the full version at Rays.com, and Gruk Software is at Gruk.com. You can get their Smart Inspect. These two utilities actually go beyond the basic logging that Output Debug String provides and provides a higher level of logging as well as a uh, special log trackers and stuff like that. Very useful, useful worth checking out. Okay, so let's talk about logging on iOS. In order to log on iOS, you need to use the iOS API dot foundation unit. And then all you need to do is call the NS log method. There's the syntax for calling it. There's a couple translations you have to go through to translate a Delphi string into the string that is needed for NS log. And then this is going to show up in the console app on OS 10. So the easiest way to run the console app is through uh, Spotlight. Just type console and it will launch it. And that's the icon there in the lower left. And when it's running, you'll see something like you see over there in the lower right-hand corner. And you just browse to um, uh, files, tilde, or tilde, slash library, slash logs, iOS simulator, whatever version of the simulator you're using, and then system.log. And that's where you'll see all the NS log messages coming from the simulator. Now, because the simulator is not going to be running much software, you're actually not going to see very many log messages in there except the ones you're generating. There will be a few others as well which actually might be useful in telling you what's going on on the system. Now, when you're using a device, it's going to be in a different spot. And in order to access those logs, you need to run Xcode. And then you open the organizer window, which the shortcut is shift command to, and navigate to the console node for the selected device that you have attached. And in here, you'll actually see quite a bit of other messages because it's fairly common for people to leave some messages in there, in their apps when they're shipped. So, um, you'll need to look carefully to find your messages. So logging on Android, you use the Android API dot log unit. And they actually have four different methods you can call. There's log I, W, E, and F. Now, each of these uh, do the same thing, except they have a additional flag on it saying it's either informational message, or warning message, error message, or fatal message. Now, functionally, they're all the same. The only difference is how they are flagged in the log output. So you can log all your messages as information messages if you want to. That's fine. Or you can log them all as fatal messages. Logging something as a fatal message doesn't trigger any immediate failure. And there's an example of the syntax you need to use to call the log message on Android. So in order to view the logs from an Android device or emulators the same way, you can use the Android Debug Bridge, ADB. ADB is a command line utility. Highly recommended you uh, learn more about ADB and use it because it's a very powerful way to interact with your Android devices or the emulator. And it has a command called logcat. So from the command line, you'd say ADB logcat, and this will dump everything that's in the log. Um, there's some flags you can use to filter that because you'll see there's just tons and tons of information coming from the Android operating system as, as well as other apps on the device. ADB is located in that path you see there by default for XE5 unless you've installed Android SDK someplace else. So I suggest adding that to your path. I do. It's very useful to get access to ADB. Another option for viewing logs from the Android device emulator is you can actually use the Android debug monitor. And this is a GUI version of uh, the information that comes from ADB Logcat as well as a lot of other information. It's very, very powerful dialogue. And you can launch that from that path you see there, which is slightly different than the other one, and you want to launch monitor.bat. Now, there's actually previously DDMS is the, was the, what you used, which is the um, Dalvik Debug Monitoring Service. Um, if you run DDMS.bat, it says, hey, use monitor.bat instead. It's newer and more deprecated. Uh, interestingly, if you go to the documentation on DDMS, it doesn't mention being deprecated, and you don't find any information about the Android debug monitor. They both work similarly. Um, the the monitor.bat is just the newer one that's replacing DDMS. Okay, so logging on OS 10. 
An S log is what you would use, but it's not imported in Delphi. So in order to import it, here's the code you can use there to import it. You need to use those three units and then define a type and a constant. And then right there is the import for it. And once you've imported it, the call is exactly the same as it was on iOS. Now, in order to view the log, you're going to go back into console again, which is what we used for the simulator. And you're going to just go to the very top node there where it says all messages. And that's going to show you all the messages that are logged with NSLog on your system. Now, there's an alternative way you can use if you only want to view the messages for your app, and that's to launch your app via the terminal. Now, apps on OS X are packages and or bundles, and these bundles are in a directory with a .app name or .app extension. And so in order to launch this, you actually need to browse into your bundle and to do that, for example, if you're just using the uh, PA server, you're going to go into home slash PA server slash scratch dir, and then whatever the name of the connection is. So there'll be a couple options there. You can look and find the one that matches the connection you're using from Delphi. And then you're going to find project.app. And so project is the name of your project on Delphi, unless you've given it a different name. And you're going to go into that folder there, and then into contents slash Mac OS 10. And then there's going to be a file there with the name of your project without an extension. Okay, so if your project was project one, it would be project one with no extension. And so you're going to launch that. Now, if you browse into that directory and you just type project one, it won't execute that because by default on OS 10, it doesn't execute files in your current directory. So you can type dot slash project one and that'll launch it. Or you can just type that whole path out there from anywhere in your system and it will launch the app. When you do that, then all the NS log messages from your app will show up in that console window there. And so that's an easy way to do, see just the NS log messages coming from your app. Interestingly, you can actually still you can use right line at that point as well, and the right line messages will show up in that window too. So kind of cool. Okay, so now I've told you how to do this on each platform individually. I'm going to tell you how to do this using DX Library. So you're going to get DX Library from Google Code, and you can use the open from version control in Delphi to just download this from, from Subversion and save it locally. And there's the URL there. And you just need to add the path of where you downloaded that to to your search path, as well as this path here to plat cross-platform utils. There's a file in there that is used by DX Library one of the calls in it. So you need to add that path to your search path and then DX library works. And then all you need to do is add a reference to uses dx.utils.logger and then call log passing a Delphi string. So very easy to use and it automatically calls the appropriate logging call for all four of those platforms we just discussed in order to send a lot output out there. There's a couple other features in there where you can actually have it log to a list box, for example, in your application or any kind of t-string list or a log file, etc. So it's kind of a little more robust as well as being a nice abstraction across all those platforms. So we've got a simple demo app here that contains two projects, a mobile version and a desktop version, and it uses the DX Utils logger. So in the code here for the log button, it just calls the log method. Here it uses the DX Utils logger. And then the DX logger also has this thing where you can set external strings. This gives you the ability to show a log in your app or somewhere else, maintain it yourself, of any messages that are sent to log. So fairly useful um, there. So I have it running on my Galaxy S3 here, and I'm going to use the console version. So I have ADB on my path. <laughs> So uh, log cat, I'm going to do a dash C, and that's going to clear my log out so I don't have a bazillion things flying past right away. And then I'm going to tell it to do it in format brief. This is all explained in that URL I provided that for more information on log cat. So I'm going to go ahead and run that. And so there's two, a couple messages that are appeared already since I cleared it. And I'm going to go ahead and hit the log button here. And we see right here it says, hello, debug logging from code rage 8. So now... In order to get out of LogCat, I'm just going to hit Control-C, and I'm going to type Monitor. This is going to launch the Android Debug Monitor. And again, because I've already put this on my path. So here it's come up. Lots of messages in here. This gives you the ability to look up device, your, uh, processes on your device, browse the directory, all sorts of fun stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and log again. And right there, hello, debug logging from Code Rage 8 showed up. 
So application name in here, you can filter. You can do it from the command line as well. You have to know the all the switches, but you can filter to specific applications, tags, etc. See, look now, a whole bunch of stuff just showed up. So that's the wonderful stuff. If you don't have the filtering turned on. Okay, so let's take a look at the Windows app. Let's start that project. I'm gonna run it with debugging turned on. And if we look in the event log right here, I'm gonna hit log. Boom, hello, debug logging from Code Rage 8. And if I run it without debugging, go ahead and run 64-bit version just for the heck of it. Then I'll bring up, this is the uh, debug view. And there's a couple other things have popped up in here just since it's sitting there in the background. I hit log, and here is our message. Hello, debug logging from Code Rage 8. So it even works with 64-bit version. Um, yeah, so debug view was one of the examples of the third-party apps I showed you. Um, it's available. And if you don't, if you have debugging turned on, if you're running in debug mode, then debug view can't view it. So we've already got it running in um, the simulator here. This is the iPhone simulator, so I'm going to hit log. And, and then if we go look in the, this is the console here. And I got to scroll down here to iOS 7 system log. And right there, hello, debug logging from Code Rage 8 showed up. So that's how you get to it from there. So now let's go ahead and run it on, we'll go back here, and we'll launch the, uh, this is the, I'm sorry, here we go. This is the uh, Mac OS X app. So many different platforms, hard to keep track of them all. And I'm going to say hello from OS X. This is a different version that doesn't have the string already in it. Hit log, hello from OS 10. Now if I go over here and look, and get to the right one, this is console, hello from OS 10. Show it up there. So the other way to see that one is I can launch terminal, and then go into, um, it's a rad PA server, ratchter, ls, and so I have a couple different options here, and I want the gym host one host and then here's all the different apps I've ran so I want to go into dx demo dot app and go into the dx demo folder oh sorry cxcd dx demo desktop app that's the one I want forgot I had a different version of that and in here I want to go into contents and then Mac OS. So here is the DX demo without an extension. So I'm going to use the dot slash DX demo and run it. And so it started a new instance here. Hello in the terminal. I hit log and it logged it there. And then I can also use right line here. And it's hello in the terminal via right line. So there that's one way to see just the output from your app if you want to isolate that. Okay, so now this is running on my physical iPad that's being viewed via reflector here. And I'm going to go ahead and hit log. And it logged that. And so now if I jump over here to Xcode and go to console and scroll to the bottom, he load, hello debug logging from Code Rage 8 showed up. So that worked. So now we saw it, the debug logging, how to get to the log on each platform. If you want to see how the logging is accomplished, if you look in this update console method here in the source code, you can see right here where it's calling output debug string, the log I, which is the Android version, and then NS log 2. Now NS log 2 is actually adds uh, additional information here. It adds the milliseconds because milliseconds are included in the log terminal by default. So it adds that in there. That's the purpose of NS log two. But right here you can see the code where um, it adds support for on Mac OS 10 for NS log. This you saw on the slide there. So that's how to use a DX library, how to access the logs on all the different devices from all the different sources and view the log information. All right, so let's talk about how we can call other apps on Android. So Android uses what's called an intent, and an intent's actually an object that is passed between activities or Android applications 
So in Android, each screen is a separate activity, but also each application has an activity as well. And the intent is passed back and forth between these activities in order to pass information between them. So an intent can is what we're going to use to call another application to tell it to do something. So this is the source code here that you would use. Um, what you're going to do, and I have an example code that shows just wrapping this up into a a method that you can then call and not have to worry about this every time. But a couple things in here that are interesting is that you are using the action view. There's actually quite a bit of other actions in there. And so all the examples I'm going to show you use action view. But if you look at some of the other actions that are available to you, there's other things that you can do besides view. For example, you can tell it to dial the phone directly and not just display the number in the phone, stuff like that. So uh, worth checking out some of the other options that are available from there. And we're also calling the start activity with the intent, and there's a couple other options besides start activity as well. So the URL that you're providing here can have a few different formats, prefixes on it. You can have HTTP to go to a web page, or you can say tell to go to the dialer, SMS to send an SMS message, Facebook to launch Facebook, and go to a specific page in Facebook, and other options there. Geo is what you use to go to the map. And so anybody can actually register their app to handle different URL types in order to receive messages. Well, these are just some common examples, but there may be other ones that you could use to talk to other applications. So there's a similar concept on iOS. Um, there's the code sample you're using there. And here you just use this open URL method. In the open URL method, you pass it an, a URL just like before. And the URL has uh, some similar formats as Android did. Uh, Geo is not there, and you call the maps a little bit differently. I'll show you how to do that. And you pass the URL there, and it has a thing called can't open URL to test to see if your system supports that. So, for example, if you try and use tell on an iPad, can URL say, well, nope, sorry, can't do that, because an iPad does not have a phone in it. There's how you're going to do this. And, again, I, what I would suggest doing and what I've done in my sample code is wrap both of these different calls into one method that has the same signature, and then you don't have to worry about which platform you're on because it just handles that for you. This is a simple demo just to show the different URLs you can use in the open URL or intent method to communicate with other apps. So in the code here, I have a users clause that uses different things based on the device. This is something you'd want to uh, extrapolate or abstract into a unit that would, you would use so it's not going to clutter your application code. But I just define one open URL method, and then the body of that method varies depending on the OS. So on Android, the code I showed you in the slide, where we're creating an intent and adding a string. And something I added here is the using the ID URI, the ND URI um, unit, in order to URL encode the URL. That creates a little bit different behavior, and I found it a little more reliable for making things work, especially on iOS. iOS is really picky if it doesn't like having spaces in there at all. So it made it a little more reliable there. Again, like I said, you can. there's other options here besides uh, action view. There's all the different options there. You can check those out and use those for different things. Just look at the documentation on intents from Android. And then we're going to start the activity with that intent that we created there. So all we're doing is creating an intent giving it an action, a view, and adding in the URL, and then passing the intent to the, o the platform and saying start that. Uh, if we get an exception, we'll just display it if the display error flag is set to true, um, and then we just exit with the status whether it's succeeded or not. On iOS, we're again using the URL and code. Like I said, very important on iOS to do that. It doesn't like spaces. And then we're um, checking to see if we can execute that in this URL, and if we can, we'll we'll do it, and we just return the result of that. And if we get an error, again, we can optionally display that error message. So that's all there is to it here. So let's go ahead and take a look at this running on Android. So this is the most common or simplest scenarios where I'm actually going to open a web page, and I just hit go, and it goes to embarcadero.com. And if I hit back, and this is the cool thing about Android, if I hit back, it'll actually go back to where I was in my application. So I don't have to actually put my own web browser in there. 
I can go out and spawn whatever web browser the user has as their default, which in my case was Chrome, and use that one. So now let's go ahead and hit go. But one thing I'll point out is because I'm using the ID URI, I have to have the slashes in there, the double slashes that you see there between each uh, the protocol and the content. If you don't have the double slashes, the ID URI uh, URL and code will give you an error message. So I'm going to go and uh, make a phone call. So there goes the phone number if I want to call them Barker Arrows main line. And I can send an SMS message. And this is an op example of on Android, it gives you the different re um, applications can register to handle different URLs. And so in this case, I have three different options that all say they can send uh, SMS messages. So I can just select which one I want and say just once or always, and it will go ahead and uh, send that SMS message. Now, this one here is interesting. On Android, this URL that says HTTP Twitter uh, slash code rage is not going to go to the browser. So I hit go. It's going to come up and give the options because Twitter says, hey, I know how to handle things that go to Twitter.com. And so I can use Twitter, and in Twitter, I will go view the profile for the code rage user. There we go. For some reason, Twitter would be really slow there. I'm not sure if it's the network or what. But it could also go to the browser with, with option there. On iOS, it'll always go to the browser because anything with HTTP goes to the browser. Mail2 is going to open a mail message. And then this one here, this Twitter colon slash slash is going to go directly to Twitter. So see, it went straight to Twitter there and to the, the screen name is Code Rage. And then this one here that's uh, Facebook profile. This number here is the universal ID, and you have to make a call to the graph.facebook.com slash the name of the profile page you want to go to, and find the UID, and then once you have that, then you can make this call here, and it will launch Facebook, and in this case, go to Embarcadero Technologies page. And for some reason, if I hit back, it will actually go back to the Facebook stack and not back to my previous application. So I'm just going to jump back this way. So now these are, this one's specific to iOS. This is how you go to map on iOS. So the first one here, content, contacts, people, will take me into my contacts and list all the contacts there. And then you can actually, interestingly, if you know the contacts ID, which I happen to know, 90 is delphi.guide at about.com, you can actually go to a specific contact that way. Then the geo if I do colon slash slash zero comma zero question mark and then Q equals, I can actually type an address in there. In this case, the uh, Scotts Valley location for Embarcadero. And it will search and find it and put a pin there for me. Now, this third option here with the latitude and longitude is supposed to take you to that latitude and longitude, but I found it, for some reason, has started being unreliable. I have the new version of Google Maps. I think they've changed some things on that. So if you have the old version of Google Maps installed, it might work and actually take you there. Sometimes it works, though, so I'm not sure what the pattern is. I haven't figured out what the, the deal is about why that works sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't work. Okay, so let's take a look at these on the iPad. So I'm going to go ahead and go to uh, Embarcadero.com. Pretty straightforward there, what we expected to happen. And go back into the app. Uh, telephone won't work because I don't have, this is an iPad, not a phone. And if I go to Twitter, that goes to Twitter.com, okay? But now if I go to um, down here where it says the Twitter colon slash user screen name code rage, that will go to the Twitter app and load up code rage 8, Okay. And then also for Facebook, the same URL here, we'll go into Facebook and bring up Embarcadero's page. Now, if you just put just slash FB colon, then it'll just launch Facebook, whatever page you're on before. And so now if we want to go to the map, this is maps.apple.com, question mark, Q equals, and then the address you want to go to. And this is the one that's really important that you URL encode. It will actually launch Apple Maps. There's some reason the network being, there we go, came up and dropped a pin for us. So it sees that I'm actually here at uh, Scotts Valley headquarters, um, but then the pin's out there. I'm not sure why the GPS is a little off there, but 
Anyway, there you go. That's bringing up the map. Okay, so in summary, we've talked about notifications with the T Notification Center, the uh, share sheet to for simple social media sharing or in-app sharing. Then we talked about debug logging, and we recommend the DX library. Uh, check that one out. And then we talked about inter-app communication using intents and open URL. Thank you for your time. And if you would like to contact me for more information, there's my email, jim.mckeith at embarcadero.com. And I'll put this uh, these slides and the source code up there at delphi.org slash rage 8 You can find the information there. And there I am on Twitter. One of the questions was about what I'm using to view on Android on the screen using it's called VM Lite. Um, if there's a couple extra steps you have to go through to get set up right on the desktop I'm using real VNC to view that. And so VM Lite VNC server on the Android device doesn't require root or does not require root. So that's what I'm using there. Tell anything about accessing files on the SD card. So you can access files on the SD card uh, just using the regular file system calls. Uh, you just have to browse out to the right directory. And it's a matter of finding that. Maybe I can I'll make a note about blogging about that too in the near future. Getting lots of good blog suggestions here on Code Rage, that's for sure. Uh, any hints on FireMonkey for Windows 8, WinRT, WinPhone? And the roadmap mentions a couple of platforms after iOS and Android where we've just released for Delphi and we're working on C++. The two that are listed are Linux Server and WinRT ARM as being after we finish up all the iOS and Android work. So no specific time frame is mentioned in the roadmap, but those are things that the R&D team is exploring for the feature. I need to access SMS getting a notification in my app that in acting on that SMS. How do I do that? That is a great question. Uh, not something I'm going to answer real quickly, but I will try and get well, that in my blog in the near future. Yeah, the one way I did it is I used the, the Indy SMTP component, send mail component, and I'm on AT&T, so I can send to my phone number at text.att.net. And, of course, that sends a subject line and everything else. If you just want to send an SMS, that's a good, yeah, through the API, that's a good one. I think the question was about uh, responding to SMSs, which is also possible to do. Android's open, lets you do that. Um, okay. Also a question about barcode reading sample. So there is, uh, it's a framework called OpenCV, and you can go to opencv.org, opencatvictor, would be CV, and that is an open source computer image library, and there are examples of people using that to uh, do barcode scanners. Um, I didn't see anything on their website about that, but if you search around OpenCV barcode scanner, you can find examples. It's cross-platform, works on both Android and iOS, uh, and you should be able to use that from your Delphi app in order to do barcode scanning. For Delphi XE4 iOS, there's a blog by Fernando Rizzato. Yep, no, it's, I was using an iOS-specific library, yes. Yeah, I was using an iOS-specific library. That's Article 43269. Yes, again, a specialized SDK. And I saw someone uh, else talking about you, the actual way you can call out on Android to the barcode, a barcode scanning app and then have that information come back to you. I saw someone using ZBar SDK. People talking about how to do that specifically, so yeah. hopefully we can get some information coverage on that. Okay, question about calling an FM app from another FM app on Android, like Shell Exec on Wind. Uh, yes, you use Intense, and uh, I had to talk, blog about that, or uh, hopefully cover that later. Uh, but yeah, you use Intense. Intense is how you communicate between applications and uh, on Android. So there might be another way to do it, but Intense is, it seems like the best way to do it to me. That's I N T E N T S. Yes, not intense or intense like camping. <laughs> Let's spell the same. Any examples on using type into Google API to show location resolution using lat longitude, not displaying the map as you do? So I don't have any examples on that, but it's a REST API, and you can just pass that in there. I've done that before. It's just a matter of making the call to REST API. It's pretty simple stuff. There is a second, there's two location examples that we ship with. One which is location that puts Google Map in a T web browser. The other one is in FM or FireMonkey, let me get to it. Uh, documents, Red Studio 12, samples. 
Fire Monkey Mobile, there's another location demo. Let me open it up. That gives you the reverse uh, lookup. And oh, that's right. I saw that one. Yeah. yeah. So if you look in the Rad Studio on SourceForge or in the install on, in user public documents, Rad Studio 12.0 samples, Fire Monkey Mobile, there's a location demo. If you go to users, public, public documents, Red Studio 12.0, samples, Fire Monkey Mobile. Location demo is what it's called. And that will dump out latitude and longitude, and then current address, admin area, country code, country name, locality, postal code, thoroughfare, and so on. And you can look at that, and there's there's other returns that you get from from Google. Sorry, did you type in that the name of that project? Or what was it again? Can you type in the name of that project, the demo? It's called Location Demo. And it's in the Fire Monkey samples, not the mobile code snippet. Mobile code snippet has a simple location with the location sensor and the T Web browser. Location sample. It's location demo. It's in Fire Monkey Mobile in the samples folder. Sorry. I apologize everybody. I'm I'm on the overflow room, so I'm not in the main QA stream. Yeah, we got two okay. of us trying to run four computers and two mixing boards and Yeah, so it call it uses T geocoder dot current and then you can do on geocode reverse and there's probably other I have to look at the T Geocode, geocoder class. And there's a mobile tutorial in the doc wiki called Using Location Sensors that does this reverse geocode. Uh, will C support ARC as well? That would be really cool if it did. I, <laughs> that's that's, that's I, the goal for that's mobile. That's the goal. Uh, two questions over here in the overflow room. One about, well, while we're wishing, when's Delphi ID for Mac coming? Well, We'd have to replace all the VCL bits in the ID with FireMonkey bits and, and do some other stuff as well. Uh, this second one may be for you that the Android SDK seems to work much better on Mac or Linux. I've heard a lot of people say that, and I don't know that I've found that necessarily to be the case. Uh, the Android SDK, probably, it does seem to have some roots in the uh, Unix file system, some of the characteristics about it. So that... It, that could make sense that it does. If you check out, I have a um, a blog post on Delphi.org on debugging against your remote emulator, and in that case, you actually install the Android SDK on your host machine and set up your emulator on your host machine. If you're a, a Mac host with a Windows virtual machine, that's the scenario I do. And so then you can use it on either platform and uh, use it however you need to. So it might be useful for you to check that out. Uh, if we've been testing with OS 10 Mavericks, will a Delphi update be needed to make Delphi applications compatible? I don't know if we can say anything about Mavericks since it's not released yet, but I can, I mean, if, uh, it would seem like that uh, we would be on the Mac developer program and most of us are leading edge people that may be installing that and using it and uh, finding success yeah. with it, but you know. You know, we're doing tests and, and again, if we have to do an update, for some reason for Mavericks, other than you having Mavericks and making a connection that finds the updated libraries for OS 10. Again, we'll, we'll figure out once Mavericks is out how, number one, can you take your existing projects and just build them and run them or run them as, as app bundles. Um, I don't remember Apple saying anything about everyone having to update existing apps that use uh, Mountain Lion or whatever other than for new APIs that you might want to take advantage of. Yeah. My expectation would be that uh, it will work and when it, Mavericks is released publicly, because currently the Gold Master is available through the developer program, um, that we'll have blog posts talking about that everything just works like you expect it to. But yeah. uh, we'll have to wait until that happens. Uh, I know when iOS 7 came out and I updated my machines and all the FireMonkey apps I had on iOS 7 just worked with the old themes, and then I installed the theme update and had the new themes. So, 
So here's a question about 64-bit uh, support for Mac and iOS, iPhone 5S being available. I, I, I know a lot of people I've talked to, both you know internally and externally as well, are kind of taking a wait and see approach on the iPhone 64-bit. A lot of analysts are saying you know that it seems kind of cool for a small niche of applications, um, but like games, yeah, get certain games, but not probably going to see a lot of widespread adoption. You know, it's going to people get it by default, but so we'll see what happens there. Um, and uh, Mac OS, Mac OS 64-bit probably would be something you know to help you access more than four gigs of memory in the near future. Hopefully, we might see that. There's Android. Day. Samsung talked about having ARM 64 sometime in the future as well. But so we'll look at all that stuff. And with the way the compilers work in Toolchain, you know, bolting on a an ARM 64. Yep. Uh, we have 64-bit Delphi for Windows. So we're using that instruction, those instructions, instructions that memory space. So yeah. So the way, yeah, exactly. The way that the CPU architectures become more modular, we'll, I think, definitely see a lot more flexibility and more uh, ability to do that in the future. Again, right now, iOS and Android, Delphi, C++ builder.